If you can take your seats, please. Just in case there's any confusion, we've split the, the conference into two streams now. This room is finished vehicle logistics. Uh, there is a, another session on inbound supply chain and logistics, which is in another room just across the corridor. But this one is for finished vehicle logistics. And in this session, uh, we're looking at uh, designing the network, designing the finished vehicle logistics network for the future. Once again, we've been very fortunate to have a great panel for you, consisting of, of two car makers and, uh, and a logistics company. So I'm sure we'll hear some great uh, information. The, the format will be, there'll be one presentation uh, from Beijing Changju Logistics, then we'll be going to uh, a panel discussion and Q&A uh, straight after that. So um, we've particularly allowed this session to be interactive, so be prepared, uh, have your questions ready, and, the, and as usual, uh, if you raise your hands, uh, wait for the microphone to come to you, and then say your name and your company name, and you can ask questions or make comments. But uh, I'd like to... Uh, and it's, you know, it's, it's quite great and we're very delighted as Automotive Logistics that um, to have a, a Chinese uh, company, a Chinese-owned company, I guess, speaking here. They're also our first global sponsor, so that shows the ambitions of the Chinese logistics companies now that CDC and Beijing Changju Logistics uh, are spon sponsoring our conferences all around the world. Uh, so that gives an idea of how perhaps logistics is changing. I think Christoph Sturmer in his uh, PwC presentation was saying about the change in China is not just the growth, as we've, we kind of expect growth, but what's different, different is the professionalization of the, of the Chinese automotive industry. And I think definitely in the supply chain and logistics world, I'm, I'm certainly seeing that. So I'd love, like to welcome to the, to the podium as our first speaker in this session, Davei Liu, the Director of International Department from Beijing Changju Logistics. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, very much Louis. And uh, good morning, everyone. So uh, firstly, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Davi Liu. I come from the Beijing Changzhou Logistics uh, company, which is a, a Chinese local company. So I think most of you uh, will not, never heard our names because uh, we're working for this industry over 25 years, but only focus on the local uh, market for the, for the automotive logistics. Uh, today we come to here, and the main purpose is we want to uh, let the, 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 the European uh, friends, which working also for this uh, uh, industry, know our name. And uh, if you company have the business in China, or if you have the factory, you have your, your subsidiary in China, uh, you have your branch in China, may you heard our names. So let me introduce first who we are. So, uh, why they should be heard our names? Because Changzhou is uh, the top one automotive 3PL logistic in China. Uh, this is uh, uh, we control over 10,000 units of the vehicle trucks, and the, now we have the over 12 market share for Finnish logistic uh, for Finnish logistics market in China, uh, which is including the, the local brand Chinese local brand and also the import cars. And we are the first automotive 3PL company which go into the, the public uh, stock market. And uh, we just get a permit from China government and then we, can, uh, we are the first one also for the uh, professional automobile logistic company go to the stock market. And we are the first uh, Chinese 3PL company who get a network for, with uh, European. Uh, we said, to be honest, two, two, Four years ago, we just started the international business four years ago. At that moment, we get a contract from Audi for the, for the railway business to transport the, the CKD parts. And now we set up our uh, branch office in Hamburg, and we want to de develop ourselves also in the European market. Okay. 
And the last one I already mentioned, we are the leading railway operator. And uh, why we also, uh, from China to Europe, but we also can connect to Korea and Japan because you know China we have the very uh, good port. It's a Dalian port, which is very close to the to the Korea and the Japan. So so based on this, we have the combination transportation from uh, uh, between the railway and the sea uh, transportation. We, we can re, uh, transport the the goods from European by railway to China to Dalian port. And we do the next, uh, second, uh, second, uh, fifth uh, by by ship from China to Japanese. This is to Japan and Korea. This is also from lead time perspective. Perspective. This is very very uh, shorter than sea freight. Okay, here we are Changzhou, and we have also have the two joint venture companies. The first one is the CDC. Today they also come with us together. Which is responsible for the for our rural vessel business, but in China domestic, we have the plan. Have also have the overseas rural vessel, but this will be uh, deployed in the in the 2019 or 2020. And we also have the GV. Uh, it's a uh, how how is a real uh, railway business uh, company, and he running a shuttle block train from the uh, China Harbin city named Harbin to Hamburg. We have the shuttle train every frequency is every week one block train from east to west and and the one block train from west to east. Here is our uh, gross rate and this morning the uh, gentleman from BWC also said that this last years for China market car sales market is really not good and this is also the first years we found it's a negative increase before. China market is also is always an amazing market. So every year so we keep around 15 to 20 percent increasing. You can see our because we transport the, 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 the vehicles and our growth is also very, very dramatically. And we keep the uh, 25 percent growth rate. But I want to mention it's uh, if the last year so the total market in China is really decreased. But for, for Changzhou, we still keep at 20 percent uh, increase and uh, the our transport uh, volume for the for the vehicle transportation is 2.4 uh, uh, 45 million so the total china market last year sold around 20 million so you can see we have the market share over 10, uh, over 20 percent here is our clients and most uh, i think Almost all brands, if you have the business in China, we do the business with you. So you can see we, can, we provide a service to the primary brand for, for example, Bentley, Bugatti, Lamborghini, and uh, also to the, 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 the last line, the, the bottom is a local brand which is just produce a very cheap car. So we are very flexible for the customer requirements and we can satisfy each kind of uh, level requirements. So here is a very special topic for us. Is uh, you know the the, the very famous uh, Olympic Games 2008 in Beijing. So we are the only one, uh, only one service provider for the torch relay uh, vehicles. So this is a very very critical requirement for us. We have to calculate the 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 the, the, the lead time by second, and uh, also the same time you know there are some some. Uh, on peaceful voice coming, someone go to the relay event to, to do something, but we have to prepare everything and guarantee the torch relay uh, very, very successful. Uh, the result is also very successful, and we get a very, very high press and, uh, uh, from, from government. Okay, who we are, just very quick introduce, and what we can do. So here is our company's uh, Main service scope, you see we have the main six, uh, yeah, the, 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 the service. The first one is the passenger car, and that means uh, finish vehicle transportation. The second one is the commercial car. This I'm not sure if you also have this business in, in European, because in China, for the commercial car, we, it's a, we talk about the commercial car, it's the trucks. Uh, the trucks, we deliver the trucks by the manually, because the trucks manufacturer, manufacturer when they finish the production, they needed to deliver them from the, from the factory to dealership. 
that, but you cannot use uh, the trucks to, to transport the trucks. So this, we use um, the, 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 the people to transport the, to transport the trucks, and we have over 5,000 drivers in our company to do this business. The warehousing, it's our, uh, another section of our business scope. The, the, we do the, the, the uh, both uh, vehicle component and uh, parts warehousing in China. Okay, use the car business, this is a very big potential in China. You know, for the, we, we do some research in the, uh, in the, 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 the very fast uh, developed company, uh, countries such as the US, such as the uh, European countries, the used car sales and the, the new car sales is almost equal. But in China, it's totally different. We sell the two, 20 million new cars every year, but for, for the used cars, uh, it's, I think it's only one of 10, uh, so 10 percent like this. But more and more persons, they, they, they already started to, do, to, to, to think about how to, how to develop this business. And a lot of, econom uh, we call it the, the economic business company, uh, they focus on this uh, used car business. They create a lot of uh, apps. They create a website to sell the, the used car. And we're thinking for the logistic company, the used car is also very, very, very important market in the future in China. Yeah, because the, 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 the now the, all of the, uh, because, uh, because of the, the, the sales, uh, sales organization in China, more, more car sales today is B2C means there's uh, OEMs to dealership to customer, but uh, the, the used car is uh, normally it's a C2C. So we can pick up the car from the one seller, uh, one person, the, the previous owner, and we deliver it to the, to the, to the next owner. Okay. The last one is the international logistics. So uh, we do the railway business I mentioned, and also today we, we have our the, 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 the concept here want to also develop our European network in future. Okay, here is our company resource. You see we have the truck business. We control the over 10,000 truck in the China market. We have the, 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 the rural vessel business for domestic. This we, today we have the one vessel is, run, is in operation and the two under construction. But we have also the, the big plan for 14 ships in the, in the, in the, in the, in the future to 2019, 2020. This is our warehouse situation. The square meters around 1 million and in, the, in the China market. Uh, and around the China uh, almost uh, covered all, of the, uh, all the regions of China. The finish vehicle component and the spare parts warehousing. So here is our service uh, landscape as we are the, we, we call us in China market, we call us an integrated logistics solution provider because we have all of kind of the service, uh, service in the, for, the, for the automobile logistics. So if you, are, you, you have any requirements, you have any demand for logistics for automobile, you can come to us, we can provide a solution and we also provide the, 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 the real operation. Uh, here is also our, uh, the, the, the advantage of our company because for a lot of China companies, even today, even us, we are, compared with the, with the European country, we are still students. We learn everything from, from you because the, 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 we are the developing country. Also, the, our uh, lo automotive logistics is uh, under the developing. So we try to learn uh, everything from, the, from you guys and uh, now, we, the, the most of important thing is the system, information system. We use the TMS, we use the WMS to control our the transportation as well as uh, the warehouse. And, but we, we continue to develop for this. But even this, we already be a leading company for the, internet, in, uh, for the information system in China market. And, but we will keep to, 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 to put more effort on this. Okay. So that's why, why we are here. Okay, the three main purpose we come to here, and uh, first one is we want to uh, also know more and more customers uh, because today we have we saw the lot of uh, trading uh, uh, from the between the China and the European, and uh, you also the the, the European com uh, company also set up your factory your GVs in China. So if we go to the uh, go to the 
the, 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 the European and let more and more people know us, then future is also very helpful for our business in China. Okay, this is a, we need to, we want to know more person. And this is looking for a partner to expanding the, our network in, in European and the worldwide. So we, today we also know a lot of Chinese companies like a, a BYD, like, a, like a Geely, they want to also develop, develop their business in, 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 in worldwide. They want to export some things. And uh, uh, also, we know that even China today, our GDP growth is not uh, very fast like before, uh, but we are still uh, the very important manufacturing base in worldwide. So you see, we are lo there are a lot of tier one uh, companies, they set up their, uh, their factory in China and they serve for the worldwide. So there are a lot of also demand for the, for the, for the transportation from China to the worldwide. So now we, we are very uh, engaged of this, this service and we talk with the, with, the, with the tier one and with the China local company which have this kind of demand and we can provide a service in China, uh, domestic, but we need our partners in, the, in Europe. So, that's why we, we are here. We want to know more uh, companies which are working for this, uh, this industry and we, which can provide this kind of service. We can be a partner in the future. Okay, yeah. So in summary, we want to be a bridge between Europe and uh, China. So here, I want the, the, the one thing that I want to special uh, introduce is uh, our railway business. Now we running a one uh, block train from the from the Ch China north east. Uh, the city name is uh, Harbin to Hamburg, but we can also extend it to Duisburg to the to, and also to the whole uh, European uh, the, the whole Europe. You see, this is our routine. We go from the Russia. This is a uh, in China today. We have the two ways for, for railway business. Uh, for the, uh, between the China and the Europe. And the first one is the Northwest, we go from Manjoli and uh, by the, go through by the, by the Russia and uh, enter the European by Brest from the, from the uh, and the Mala, Blasvich from the uh, Poland. And the, another one is uh, go to from, uh, the Ulumuchi, Xinjiang province and uh, by the, through by the, by the Middle Asia countries, Middle Asia countries and go to the Europe. We run the business for the north lines. We go by the Manjoli to, from the uh, Manjoli to, 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 to Europe by the, uh, by the Russia. Okay, this is a case study. We, we transported all the CKD. Uh, this business we do already four years. Okay, we pick up the parts from the, from the different uh, sites uh, in Audi in, in Germany, the castle in, in a uh, lot of cities, and we do the consolidation, and we do the, 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 the also the FCL uh, container shipment, and we just loading in the Duisburg terminal and and go to the, the Changchun directly, and finally we deliver to the Audi factory in Changchun. The total transit time is 18 to 20 days. Okay, and the the. Uh, this is a service. Why Audi choose this uh, service? Just because the lead time is really, really shorter than C freight, and the safety is also very uh, important issues. We run this business for four years. So we have no any damage, no any damage. We we transfer over uh, 800 containers, no any damage. Because you see the the the, the railway business, railway transportation model, they have no uh, so much uh, unstable factors. For example, humidity, bad weather, so no big problem for, for real with really stable transportation method. So also we can transport the, the vehicles by containers. Here you see this, so we provide the service to some uh, importers which uh, buy a car from Europe and send it to China. You see this, uh, we provide the service we stuff in the container by, for, the, for the vehicles and transport to the China. And at the same time, we can provide, we, we install the, the small tooling, a very 
uh, name the smart box to, to monitor the containers inside the situation. This can also uh, record the, G, the, the link to the GPS, record to the routine history, uh, route, and uh, uh, also the temperature, human data inside of the containers. This really provides us the, 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 all of the information is very transparent and uh, really give the, 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 our customers very strong confidence we can handle everything by, by real way. Okay, then the, 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 the last why is what, why we are here? Because we want to go in global. So uh, today we are here, we, we just want to let you know our names and if you have any interest in the, or any inquiries for the business with China, uh, if you also your China colleagues have any questions, want to, uh, want to ask us, our desk is just out of the, the conference hall. Okay, please contact with us. And the final is the concept method. The China, for China business, you can contact with me directly. For the German and the European business, you can contact with our branch manager in Hamburg, Alex and Vivian. So, yeah, let's see what will happen in the future. And uh, really thanks a lot for your listening and also tolerant my poor English. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Liu, uh, for introducing us to CDC in Beijing, Changzhou Logistics. Um, obviously, as we heard earlier, the big growth is going to be in China, so it's good to understand a little bit of what they're doing and also um, to see that logistics companies from China are becoming more international, so it's something we should be aware of uh, and see it either as hopefully an opportunity, uh, not too much of a threat. So this session is on uh, Finnish Vehicle Logistics and Designing the Network for the Future. So uh, before we go on to the questions and the panel discussions, I'd just like to give just a couple of minutes to each of the, of the other panel members just to introduce themselves to help encourage and, and so you can understand uh, a little bit more about them so to help you with questions. So I'd like to uh, invite uh, Debbie, Debbie Buswell, the European Distribution Manager for Jaguar Land Rover, just to say a few words. Good morning. Um, as Louis said, I work for Jaguar Land Rover and I look after the European distribution of our finished vehicles. Um, and that includes the strategic planning. So I, I would look after the re-engineering of new routes and then also the operational day-to-day -day and contract management of those routes that we put in place. So um, at the moment, as you can imagine, busy times with, with all of the activity that's taking place with Jaguar Land Rover. I know a lot of you out there are involved with uh, a lot of work with us at the moment. Um, so, so basically, that's, that's what I'm doing at the moment. Thank you. And as you might remember, Debbie was one of the stars of the conference <laughs> last year. But she said she was surprised people didn't want to ask her really tough questions. So bear that in mind. Yeah. Uh, and next up, I'd like to uh, introduce Hervé Moulin. Hervé. Yes, good morning. I'm um, Hervé Moulin. I'm French, so pardon my English and my dreadful accent. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, so um, I'm uh, in charge of um, uh, operational methods in the vehicle logistics uh, division of, uh, the, of the Renault Nissan Alliance uh, for Finnish vehicle logistics. So this encompasses mainly um, all the services outside pure uh, vehicle transportation, such as uh, accessory fitment, uh, pre-delivery inspection, long-term storage maintenance, uh, washing uh, services, etc. And uh, also uh, a second part of my, uh, of my job is uh, exterior partnerships. Uh, uh, for instance, I'm in charge of the relations uh, with uh, ECG, the, the Association of uh, Logistics, uh, of Vehicle Logistics, and also uh, relations with uh, um, uh, exterior uh, bodies, uh, government bodies, etc., uh, through our um, European uh, uh, Public Affairs Department. And uh, we are also uh, beginning to create uh, um, relations with other OEMs for common um, projects. 
so uh, I'm in, in that field for uh, uh, the Eastern Alliance. Okay. okay, thank you. So, uh, so we've, we understand a little bit more about where they're from to help us with the questions. I've got one or, one or two questions uh, to start us off, but as I said, the whole point of the conference is to be interactive, and that's why we've made it a panel discussion as opposed to three presentations. But the subject, uh, the title of this, of, uh, of this session is Designing the Network for the Future. Uh, so I suppose in a way an obvious question and an obvious start is how do you optimise the network? So to our two, uh, particularly the two car makers to begin the, uh, to answer that question first. Okay, so, so if I go first, um, I, I would suggest certainly collaboration. Um, and I think, I think what, what Jaguar Land Rover are encouraging is for our service providers to collaborate on our behalf um, so that we are optimising the networks. Um, we should be working together, and that's, that's what we invite the service providers to do, is, is to make sure we're filling those backloads. Um, you clearly have the intelligence about what the availability is out there. We don't pretend to be the experts in it. You are, so we encourage you to come and tell us what is the optimal solution and which ways we should be going. So, so for me, that, that's, that's one idea that we should be certainly consolidating and collaborating. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's also a way um, we mean to um, optimize the network. Um, we are doing it at our, our own level since we try to assist uh, our suppliers by um, tendering complementary flow, flow volumes at the, exactly at the same time. And not only uh, Renault Nissan flows, but also uh, geographically compatible volumes in order to um, allow our suppliers to uh, optimize their, uh, their uh, means using the whole potential of the alliance. Um, but um, um, even more, than, uh, even more than that, if we go still further, uh, another uh, possible answer to, op to optimize the network would be to identify the bottlenecks and causes of delay and cost uh, at European scale. For instance, the, the ports, roads, and railroads, the local legislations that, uh, that, causes, uh, that cause problems and delays, etc., and to cooperate between uh, logistic providers uh, car manufacturers and uh, public authorities to solve these problems. Of course, we, none of us, uh, car manufacturers and uh, logistic providers can do, can do it alone. But we think that if we start cooperating uh, with that goal, we can uh, achieve good results, um, even if it requires some investment in uh, infrastructures, for instance, we can um, uh, apply for funding from the European Union, but we, we can only do this uh, if we are several companies and uh, several uh, public authorities uh, going together to ask for it. So we think there are, there are good possibilities of cooperation in that field. Okay. And um, um, of course there are some uh, other things uh, that can be can be done, such as uh, sharing maritime uh, transport between inbound and outbound flows. Uh, we have uh, an opportunity uh, uh, in that field uh, for our Moroccan uh, uh, plant, because in, uh, in, the, in the summer, for instance, um, when um, all the tourists are uh, mobilizing the ferries, it becomes difficult for us to carry our, our parts from Europe to Morocco. Um, and at the same time, our uh, ships that carry our cars manufactured in Morocco come uh, back empty from, uh, from Europe. So there's a good possibility to share the, the uh, flows between inbound and outbound. And um, a last good opportunity we identified is uh, what uh, a concept called the, the urban delivery centers. Maybe some of you have heard of it, but um, maybe not uh, in the Finnish vehicle uh, business. 
So the idea would be to create multi-brand delivery centers open 24 hours uh, a day, seven, hour, seven days a week, close to major cities to, to deliver the cars in these, uh, uh, in these hubs, and then from these hubs to uh, do the last kilometers during um, opening hours of the dealerships and uh, while respecting with the local restrictions, etc. So uh, we think it could be a good opportunity. It was identified by ECG uh, some time ago, in 2013, but uh, never studied thoroughly uh, between the LSPs and uh, interested uh, uh, car manufacturers. So we think uh, we could uh, start uh, uh, investigating this, uh, this field seriously. Um, in uh, a working group we recently created with uh, ECG, um, the capacity working group, we think we could uh, uh, start investigating such, uh, such projects between uh, car manufacturers and uh, logistic providers. And uh, Mr. Yu, kind of changing that around a little bit, is is it different in China? If we look at you know some of the things that's been mentioned there, for example, collaboration. Uh, a lot of the logistics companies are linked to uh, to the to the car maker or daughter companies of the car maker. So, uh, from your point of view, as a logistics company, as an independent logistics company in China, are there operation are there opportunities to encourage collaboration between? Uh, different companies and, and do they give you the opportunity to, uh, do they see you as someone who can optimize their logistics or do they just see you as a transportation company? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, we have the very, very big potential to do the collaboration in the future. Even we are the, the logistic company, uh, most of this uh, China today, the situation is we follow with the OEMs, the network developing and we, uh, we, we just uh, Chasing for their their new plant and new facility, and we do the service service for the we provide the service for them. But at the same time, when we go to when we see the 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 the, the logistic market, when we see the other three PLs, uh, we also think uh, we set up too many facilities maybe in the, the, the in the same place, and we try today we 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 try to do this also. Uh, for example, we the, you know the China the new new truck market, vehicle transportation truck, uh, truck standards will be, uh, div will be announced very soon. Because you know if today you go to the China, you will see the trucks is really uh, different than Europe. We have the, uh, in Europe normally you can, you can transport the, the almost uh, around the six to eight units per truck, but in China we can transport almost 20 to 20, 21, 22. Uh, units per truck, and uh, but the, the things need to change. The government will announce the new regulation, and this is a very uh, big uh, opportunity for the for the company like us to do the, to do the uh, synergy and the collaboration in our own industry in 3PL, the the, 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 the scope of 3PL, and uh, same time we have our development. Uh, uh, strategy, we set up the component around the China because China is very big and the future, if the OEMs have the, have the requirement, you can directly come to us to choose and they don't need to set up their own facility. I think this is also one kind of the collaboration. Yeah, here is uh, in China's situation. Okay, thank you. Don't forget, uh, any time you have a question, I've got some questions myself, but you know, feel free to, uh, to contribute. Uh, the next question is about the uh, investment requirements. Um, there, is a, there is a need for investment in new equipment, new technology. The, the kind of, uh, I suppose, the feedback we get from the industry is often uh, you, car makers don't give uh, the ideal situation to encourage or allow uh, logistics companies to invest. So, uh, what? Firstly, I suppose, what are the investment requirements that you feel uh, to optimize finished vehicle logistics? To so car makers first. Um, I, I think we're all only too aware of the uh, the constraints, the capacity constraints we have, 
uh, regardless of the mode of transport. So, so we understand that absolutely investment is required. And I think there has been a step change with the OEMs. I think um, that we recognise we have to find a way of supporting our service providers. Um, it is a partnership. We, we need the, uh, the service providers to invest. And I think um, what we're encouraging now is um, flexibility with contract duration, certainly. Um, and that could be shorter contracts in order to help you to align with other OEMs and things that are going, going on. Um, equally, it could be longer duration. So, so the investment, the, the price of investment we, we know is incredibly expensive. Um, you need to have incredibly deep pockets. So again, what we're inviting is talk to us about contract term and, and what you would need. And, and I think um, I've seen a significant change in recent years where, where we absolutely do have the appetite now to, to work together and it, it's very much a partnership in that respect. Mm -hmm. Moulin? Um, yes, uh, Debbie is perfectly right to say that uh, um, in, in this investments will be uh, a key factor in the next, uh, the next few years because uh, investment is tra in transport means but also in uh, infrastructure and uh, human resources is very important uh, at this stage of the, of the market. Especially since uh, all the, the existing capacities are mobilized at the same time with months and peaks, etc. that are uh, um, a, necess a necessity in our uh, industry by now. We can't, we can't escape them. Even we logistics uh, uh, departments uh, of the OEMs uh, uh, can't decide on that, but it, we must consider it as a fact in the, in the industry by now. And uh, we know that uh, catching up with the needs uh, regarding investment will take uh, some time. It, uh, we won't, uh, we won't reach a significant uh, le level of uh, uh, transport capacity uh, in the next few years. Uh, it, will be, it won't be enough, in fact. We know that. Okay. So, um, but still, the investment needs offer good opportunities, paradoxically, yes, because uh, uh, the new trucks are um, very uh, uh, convenient, They're, they are more efficient than the, um, than the former ones in terms of uh, uh, quality of transport, damage reduction, cost and carbon footprint. They have, uh, we can have uh, less fuel consumption and more um, load factor maybe and uh, certainly more um, more quality because the, the new trucks can accommodate larger cars, wider cars, and uh, so it's better for this type of cars, but also for the other types of cars that are uh, that are transported. It provides more qu more quality in transport. So, um, uh, since the the average age of the fleet is very high, uh, some speak about uh, seven and a half years, but some. Uh, they also speak about 10 years, for, uh, at least for the trailers themselves. So uh, um, any uh, renewal of the fleet will, uh, will um, result in a very significant improvement of, the, of, these, uh, of uh, these factors, uh, quality and uh, lead time and uh, cost. So it's a good, a good opportunity now to renew the fleet and see the good results that uh, ensue. And besides, we also think that the current shortage compels everyone, um, logistics providers and car manufacturers, to find ways of coping with the existing volumes together. Once again, I, uh, I perfectly agree with uh, Debbie when she speaks about cooperation and collaboration. Uh, we, we are all in the same uh, predicament now, with uh, insufficient uh, capacities. So we must, uh, 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 until we, we recover a, a good situation, we must uh, cope with the problem together and, 
uh, think uh, of what we can do. All the uh, all the all the good ideas are welcome to uh, to uh, go through this period and still uh, manage to distribute our volumes. So. Uh, once again, I come to the last industry me meeting organized by ECG to create this uh, common working group on capacity issues. Uh, this, this is intended to be a, a means of uh, better cooperation to uh, cope with the, uh, capacity issue uh, until it becomes better, situation becomes better. But of course, this. Uh, must be done in uh, total respect of competition laws. Uh, and uh, this will be done uh, under ECG supervision. But I think we have uh, mm -hmm. something to say about it also. No, I completely agree with you. That, um, that I think we've all demonstrated that, that we have an appetite, and, and you're quite right, uh, competition law <coughs> in, insists that, that we, we stay within those parameters. But, and that's why we, we invite you to assist us <coughs> Um, we have no issue with um, mixed loads, with sharing capacity with other OEMs, and, uh, and we just need to, together, find a way of, of doing that. So can you stop agreeing with each other and a bit more fighting with each other? You can't speak yeah. competitors, for goodness sake. <laughs> Uh, but, but to Mr. Yeah. Liu, again, you know, we talked about the professionalisation of uh, Chinese logistics. Uh, the new trailers are, are, being, yeah. are coming in. Uh, still a lot of investment in IT has to come in. So what are the investment opportunities or, or challenges that you're facing? Yeah. I think the, just I mentioned that because the trailer type is changed, there are very big investment will be occurred in China market because today the I think at least 90 percent of the of the trailers in China market is future is will be illegal. So this is uh, very important for every company. If you want to continue this business, if I want to continue play this game, you have to to invest a lot for for upgrade your for renew all your your trailers. So this is uh, today in China market is a very hot uh, topic. So every company discussed how to prepare this, and at the same time, the OEMs ask us a lot of questions: so how you can guarantee because your capacity uh, of the the loading factors is re decre uh, reduced very seriously. How you can guarantee you you keep the 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 the, the, the same service level? You can you can transport our car in time. So now we all all of the companies, I think. Uh, to, to have the, or their own plan to do the investment for the new trailers. Yeah, this will be happening very soon because uh, from China government, the news is uh, from beginning of 2018, the trailers, the, 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 the illegal trailers were definitely forbidden on the road. This is, uh, uh, yeah, today's very big opportunity for investment. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And it's not only a question of, uh, of trailers. Uh, another uh, very important challenge is the, um, driver training and recruitment. We know that, yes. Because, uh, uh, and we think that um, uh, the logistics providers should uh, uh, here again uh, federate their resources to accelerate and improve driver's recruitment and uh, training uh, through advertising campaigns, recruitment forums, creation of schools, things like that. But uh, 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 we are worried about uh, the lack of uh, experienced drivers and the fact that uh, the, the, uh, the aging pyramid is, uh, is uh, showing that um, many, uh, uh, many um, truck drivers, uh, experienced truck drivers are uh, in, the, uh, in the most uh, 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 aging uh, categories. And uh, young people do, do not want to do the job anymore. So uh, uh, we recommend that we, we could also benchmark companies who are more efficient at finding drivers and maybe make the job more, more attractive. There are some means, uh, for instance, to, uh, to um, uh, make the loading operations uh, easier. We will speak about, about it later, I think. But, uh, uh, there, there is a, there's a real, uh, really um, an issue about that. And we are in Unison, we insist on a high level of training for the drivers because we consider that um, the consequences are, are the same for an old truck and an inexperienced driver. 
um, you have more transport damages, you spend more time in uh, loading and lo uh, loading operations, and uh, you uh, you also have um, a sub optimization of the load factor. When you have an experienced driver, it's the same with an uh, old truck. So uh, for us, it's uh, also uh, an important issue. Okay, uh, we've got a question here, please, first. That's right, Adrian's coming, eventually. He's put on a bit of weight, he can't squeeze through like he used to be able to. Thank you. It's always awkward me, the furthest point in the room. Uh, Mike Sturgeon, ECG, uh, and um, you beat me to it, Herve, because I, I was going to ask about driver training, and uh, uh, but we know we've talked about that before. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting that you, you, you take that angle, because Debbie talks about uh, partnership and uh, working together and cooperation. And, uh, and I'd like to ask, uh, and perhaps specifically for Debbie, because it's a, it's a subject however you and I have discussed before, is what role does the OEM have to play in the, uh, improving the uh, driver recruitment and retention issue? Because this is a, uh, it's not just our sector even, but it's a Europe-wide problem and it's not going away. Um, and it's not something the LSPs are necessarily going to fix on their own. No. And, I, and I, I also, I think, I think we have to encourage um, the, the recruitment of, of drivers. But I also think, um, given some, some of, of what we've heard this morning around the new technologies, I think the profile of, of drivers and, and what they'll be required to do in the future will be different, completely different. Um, we could have the autonomous car, we could have self-loading, we could have all of these things coming on board. And, and I think that may present us with, with further opportunities where the skill set of a driver could be completely different and may well encourage it. I think we've, we've got to move with the times as well as replicating what we've always done in order to keep things ticking over. Um, I think we also need to consider the, 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 the new challenges, the new opportunities that we've got with uh, new technologies. Okay, <coughs> for, for China market, I think, uh, special for the drivers. So future, I think the the the, the, the because the, the the trailers changed, they are wet. Uh, there'll be more and more opportunities uh, coming so will be generated. And uh, for the for the people recruitment and also for the for the training is also the very important topic in future. Uh, yeah, for for our companies, I think we have this kind of a plan for the for the future training, or we can also have the may have the chance to cooperate with some uh, the, the, the 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 experienced companies expert to 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 also to uh, develop the the trainings because today, to be honest, in China, the training is still uh, for that like our logistics company is still on the very low uh, level. We just train the 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 the, 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 the drivers so how to driver safety, how to guarantee the cars, uh, customers' cars, no problem, uh, be also be the safety, but it's still not enough. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a very skilled uh, job. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, question over here. Thomas, you got a question? Thank you. Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I uh, just, uh, it's Thomas Cullen from Transport Intelligence. Uh, I would just preface my remarks that uh, I've been hearing this stuff about finished vehicle logistics, about collaboration and partnership in uh, finished vehicle logistics for well over 20 years. And during that time, we've had both small and large finished vehicle logistics companies on the land side go bankrupt one after the other. Um, so what I would what I would ask you is, um, why would any investor, whether they're in they're outside the sector or inside the sector, enter this um, sector when returns on capital are so dismal? Why would they do that? And if they did want to do it, how would they enter the sector to serve your needs on a on an economically sustainable basis? What would they do, and how would they do it? Well, 
uh, it's a question of investing or not investing uh, for the for these um, for the logistics companies nowadays. Uh, there's a, a terrible necessity to invest. In fact, we we think that the market in the years to come will be influenced mostly by companies who invest today, uh, because there's such. Um, uh, strain on the, um, on the uh, necessity to distribute our the, the vehicles we manufacture, and you'll see, you'll see that uh, you see that uh, in the next few years the market will continue to grow, and uh, we will have more and more vehicles to distribute. So uh, uh, the car makers uh, will need to rely on. Uh, uh, logistics providers that that can uh, give them the necessary uh, uh, volume transport volumes. Uh, we we don't want to we won't uh, uh, be ready to uh, go on with uh, um, uh, logistics providers that uh, uh, always ask us for alternative transport solutions and. Uh, um, in peak periods, and uh, it's, it's difficult for for everybody, for uh, for us and for them, and uh, to find uh, to always find alternative transport solutions because uh, the investments uh, have uh, the necessary investments haven't been done, and so uh, it's uh, we definitely definitely want to. Uh, um, uh, promote the use of uh, of um, logistics providers that can answer our needs. So uh, we really consider th that the risk for LS for logistics providers, the real risk, is not to to invest by now because uh, we have uh, a growing market all over Europe, and uh, it will last several years. Several years. That's uh, um, our own. Um, General Manager, uh, our own CEO, Carlos Ghosn, uh, um, uh, said it uh, a few days ago. So uh, uh, the, the risk for uh, investment is limited because uh, there, there's a lot, the volumes are high and will, and will grow. So, um, there's more risk for a logistics provider not to invest than to invest by now, we think. And I'd, if, if I could just reiterate that, if we go back to, to us wanting to form a partnership, I think the risk is reduced because our commitment is we need you to invest. The demand is there. Um, we have significant capacity issues, particularly around Europe. So undoubtedly it's going to require investment, but, but I think what we're saying is we will we'll share in that risk by giving you the contracts that, that we need in order to make sure, we're not going to say to you, right, okay, there's, there's a significant investment required and, and we'll talk about a two year contract and then walk away and you're left with the bill. It's about working in partnership to make sure we get what we need from a capacity perspective and equally you have a level of confidence that it's the right answer to invest. <laughs> um, but that's exactly what will happen, isn't it? Um, if, if the reason that you're short of capacity in terms of, of trucks, truck assets, road assets, is because you put the people out of business. They couldn't invest because you didn't allow them to get a decent return on the asset. So that's why you don't have the assets anymore. So if, if I go to somebody on the outside and say, uh, they're saying to me, oh, we could buy a fleet of however many truck trailers or whatever, if you look at the data, it doesn't make sense because there's no return on it. And it's very hard for them to make that investment when they see that you're, you're suggesting they should do, when they see your behavior over 20 years, is to do exactly what you've just described. The, the, they sign a contract for, for two or three years or five years in state of the art, very expensive capacity, and then they're driven out of business because the vehicle manufacturer just turns around and says, actually, we don't want your, your assets anymore, knowing what will happen, and knowing that they will then be able to pick up those assets at a discounted price when they re-enter the market as a result of the bankruptcy activity. If you look at the motorway going up and down 
the look at the carriers going up and down the, the motorway, you can see the state of many of the carriers. But that's a product of your purchasing strategies. So you've got to actually say to investors, you've got to convince investors somehow that you won't behave in the way that you've been behaving for the past 20 years. And, and I think that's, that's what we were clearly saying, that there's been a step change. And, and you're, you're talking about historically how things yeah. may have occurred. And what we're talking about is recognise there are capacity constraints. And in order to encourage investment, we are committing to a partnership which says, tell us what that contract duration looks like, whether it be long or short. Let's work together in giving you a security so that, yes, we get the capacity, but also you get the confidence that, that it's the right thing to invest. I think historically, you're right. But, but I think the opening statement from myself was there's been a significant step change and an appetite to work together to make sure we bridge this gap. And it, it's not going to be bridged immediately. It's, you know, the lead times, there's going to be a couple of years that we're going to have to really work together and look at other opportunities, the collaborations, the consolidations. But um, agreed, we need to change the patterns of before. And I think that's, that's what we're encouraging. And the tier supplier base, the part suppliers, a lot of the innovation that's really enabling the automotive industry to move on is coming from very strong part suppliers, like Robert Bosch and companies like that have become so big, uh, so powerful, and yet because of that, maybe they can invest more. Uh, so for vehicle logistics in this, instrument, in this instance, should we encourage uh, bigger and stronger suppliers? Should we encourage mergers and acquisitions to have a few good, strong companies? They'll be strong financially, strong to be able to invest uh, is that a good thing, or do you prefer kind of, I don't know, almost divide and conquer, to put it negatively, but that's not necessarily where I'm looking at it from. Uh, do you think it's good to develop and enable the logistics companies to become big, powerful, strong, and therefore in a position to innovate more? Um, you mean... Um, to encourage the regroupment of uh, companies to have um, bigger um, uh, partners. Yeah. Mm. But it's a risk in reducing competition, <laughs> perhaps, but it might give them the strength to be able to, to do things that the 100 small companies can't do that maybe five, ten strong companies will be able to do? So, certainly, uh, uh, to have uh, strong partners uh, will, uh, uh, will be something, uh, something good in the future because uh, we are not uh, uh, immune to uh, market changes, etc. And, uh, the, and uh, the, more, um, the more flexible companies can be, uh, the easier they can uh, adapt uh, in the long term. Whereas uh, with uh, small uh, with small partners, uh, it's uh, um, sometimes it's uh, it's difficult to uh, to really have um, uh, um, optimiz optimization, and uh, uh, they, uh, it's hard for uh, for them to resist in hard times. I think. Yeah, Christoph Wust from Ford. I have a question to the Chinese regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, will we see also IT standards in any form or shape coming with the new regulations? Positioning standards, where is my vehicle, or something like that? You showed. Uh, some techs and you are using. Will there be something coming on that side as well if you have new regulations coming? Mm, to be honest, up, <coughs> up to now, there is no this kind of uh, planning from the government to, to give uh, guidelines for the, for, the, for the system. And uh, they are, because you know China market, we are really the, the under the developing, so we have to solve the problem one by one. The now very very serious problem is, uh, it uh, yeah we call the illegal tap truck. This is a 
this already need a lot of effort. Uh, not only government, the OEMs, the ourselves, we have to work together to solve this uh, problem and uh, guarantee the, 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 the we change the everything back, uh, go to the, the, the right way. This is the uh, first things. And I think from the, from the system, uh, Today, the, the companies uh, who, which run the logistics business, we already start by ourselves to use uh, like GPS and uh, we use a TMS, but uh, still not uh, any, any re voice come from the, from the, from the regulations. Okay. okay. All right, we've talked about um, maybe from an uh, investment from the companies, uh, but what about you know, utilizing the assets better, the assets that are out there, or, or how we can utilize the assets to eliminate waste. Uh, any comments on that from the, from the panel? Um, yes, I think um, we, should, we should consider um, cross-industry. So, so not just, for me, not just finished vehicles um, solely. We, we need to consider some of the, the transportation and the assets we use potentially for inbound. And, uh, and use those also for finished vehicle distribution. Um, equally, you know, there's, there's retailers of, of all sorts of products out there that we could potentially utilise some of their assets. Um, I think we need to be more creative, more innovative in the different assets that we use and different means of doing that. Um, I think we, we can't be a one-trick pony anymore and FVD stick with uh, finished vehicle distribution. We have to be a little bit more clever about what we do. Hervé? Yes, of course, it's a tough question because uh, nowadays the, the, unbalanced, the unbalanced flows have a tendency to increase, especially uh, for, uh, for us, for instance, with the collapse of the Russian market. Uh, flows from uh, west to east are uh, even more reduced and uh, east to west uh, remain strong. So. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to, uh, to optimize the use of the assets. So um, we, the answer also uh, lies in, uh, uh, I think, in um, cross-optimization, uh, optimization on a, on a larger scale than today. Uh, lobbying as an industry and, uh, um, we, and having uh, joined up thinking about that uh, between uh, OEMs and LSPs. But uh, the optimization at a, at a narrower scale is becoming more and more difficult. It, it really needs more cooperation to, fa to face this, uh, this challenge of waste reduction. Okay. And multimodal development also uh, mm -hmm. can be a good solution, but it's uh, always difficult because of different regulations and costs. And Mr. Liu, what are you doing to optimize your assets or make them uh, more efficient or? Yeah, <clears throat> today I think from the three PL companies, the, the, the utilization for the, for, the, for, the, for the asset is really important for us because we, we can generate more uh, profit, per profit uh, when we do the good job. And uh, yeah, we have the such kind of department, it's a planning department every day they they're looking for the, 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 the opportunities to do the, the to do this kind of jobs, and um, yeah, I think this is a uh, this is today we are we, what, what things we are doing now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. Question at the back, please. Yes, my name is Ruud Vossebelt from Inform. Um, Deborah, you gave a great presentation last year about telematics. Uh, many people talk about, okay, RFID is over, telematics is the newest thing. Uh, do you believe that telematics can help as well to reduce complexity in the process from factory to dealer and uh, maybe reduce all the messages that need to be sent through from factories to logistic service providers? I was at the company yesterday, they process 60 million uh, EDI messages a year. Do you think there is something to improve in that area with telematics? 
I think, um, as, as you will remember from last year, t telematics um, offers us and will offer us a lot of opportunities. I think some of the challenges we have are, are that technically we're not compatible. Um, different service providers, different OEMs, um, we're all disjointed and we need to find a way of, of standardising the information that we're using, um, making it available to all. Uh, telematics, for me, it, um, it absolutely assists in eliminating the waste because it accelerates all the processes. We're, we're eliminating the manual intervention and, and, and lots of the non-standard processes. So um, I know it's very much in its infancy, but, but yes, I think it can, can certainly assist and, and the more available we make it, I think um, the more standardised we make the transfer of knowledge and data, the better. You kind of dismissed uh, RFID there a little bit. Uh, we've kind of gone from, you know, RFID is dead and telematics is the future. I'm not sure that telematics yet provides all the information that you need uh, for, for the tracking and, and clear visibility uh, for the vehicles. I don't know if, uh, if Masra or Mr. Ollison is prepared to say anything about the, the, the benefits of, of RFID. I know I'm picking on you a little bit, Jürgen, but uh, are you prepared? <laughs> You're talking about a curveball, <laughs> being American colloquialism, but I, I, you know what, I, I, I don't know, because it's considered to be old technology, and we all know it, and it works, and it's, uh, it, it's perhaps different. I think it's a bit off the general discussion that's going on about how do you share data amongst uh, service providers and manufacturers in a much more collaborative manner that has been, has been done in the past, and how do you reduce your empty miles, because the empty miles is going to give you, of course, the added capacity at, at, uh, at zero cost. But just on, on the cost side, if, if you look on the investment side, I'm not a banker, but uh, if I were, you know, I could choose putting my money into the European Central Bank Clearinghouse and not have to pay for it. I could buy some rigs and, you know, the cost of, uh, of assets in, in that respect, at least from an interest point of view, has become uh, close, close to zero. So hopefully that will spur some of the investments into, uh, in, into assets, whether they will last for, for seven or, or ten years. Uh, when it comes to RFID, you know, we looked at it in, in Mazda from a couple of different angles, which were the technology has become so cheap that it's, uh, you know, it's less than a buck a car. It's probably 10 cents from the, from the tagging point of view. Um, but the opportunity to take some of the information that we get and and combine it with social media activities, etc., is uh, is quite uh, is quite strong. Um, and the last thing that we did, where I, where we saw the biggest benefit, was that we used the uh, app, so smart app applications, in connection with floor plan checks uh, at the dealership. So we used the asset control need of any manufacturer to optimize how do we do floor plan checks. And the, and the reduction in floor plan checks actually paid for the whole project. But that's, that's, a, that's a different story perhaps for a different day. And I don't think RFID in this discussion has anything to do with the need to share data. Perhaps we should go to an Amazon and tell them, you know, everybody's going to drop the data in because they want to be a logistics provider anyway. So perhaps there is a room for them in, in, in a complete different environment and in a complete different business where they look at uh, logistics uh, resources and, and, and risks from a very, very different angle than we do normally as, uh, as vehicle manufacturers. Um, I think the ECG has a very, very big role to play, and it's the only organization we have where you can consolidate views and also get the regulatory side of the business uh, under control with the European Union. But um, the European Union is actually quite easy to talk to if we are specific and simple in, in the request we have.
getting to 22 cars per, per truck, you know, that would be great, but I think that's a long way away, so thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. And kind of developing that theme a little bit, uh, you know, it, let's look a little bit at technology. How will technology play a role in, in helping to optimize your, your finished vehicle logistics networks? Hervé? Oh, um, technology will certainly have a big part to play, we think. Because uh, in our opinion, the vehicle logistics sector hasn't known any major innovation uh, for quite a long time, both in terms of methods and technology. And uh, I've been in the business for uh, uh, a long time, <laughs> and uh, uh, it's pretty much always the same. Uh, it doesn't compare to many other fields in the commercial industry. We've seen uh, huge uh, changes in commerce and uh, industry uh, uh, fields uh, in the, uh, like uh, Amazon that, uh, that was mentioned and uh, um, all the digital uh, commerce, etc. Whereas in Finnish logistics vehicles, uh, uh, it's been much less, uh, much less um, uh, innovative. So, but we think that by now we have uh, very good opportunities for uh, big changes. Of course, there will, there's uh, the improved transparency that we, we need through data exchanges and the use of telematics in, uh, in the logistics flows. We need to have uh, access, we um, OEMs, to uh, um, more data in order to give uh, information to our customers that are more and more demanding in, the, in that respect. Uh, it's uh, very um, strange to, to see that uh, if, you, if you order a book or uh, a DVD, you have uh, much more information about uh, its, uh, its um, uh, logistic flow than if you order a car if you are the final customer. So uh, uh, there's a discrepancy that uh, needs to be thought of and uh, we, we can't overlook this, this type of demand from our uh, customers. So real-time tracking and uh, information sharing is, uh, very, will become more and more important, but it, it needs a good deal of uh, standardization and uh, facilitation of data exchanges. Uh, we can also have uh, workflow management tools in compounds and ports to, to adapt very quickly to, log to um, shipment uh, changes. Uh, we, uh, this type of uh, uh, workflow management tools uh, we would be interesting to, to develop. And uh, also has the, the, the autonomous vehicles. So uh, it's, uh, it's been some time already that in the Paris Motor Show, I saw uh, a Nissan uh, prototype that could uh, go and park itself uh, in, uh, in um, uh, a nearby uh, car park and come back when the owner uh, would call it uh, through her smartphone. So uh, autonomous vehicle movements within compounds and ports are not uh, science fiction. Uh, it can, uh, it's uh, the reality of the near future. We can very well imagine uh, the vehicles to park themselves on predetermined compound areas or to come uh, to the truck that is going to load them. Uh, uh, all at the same time. If you have a list of eight vehicles, you call them up, and they come from their parking spaces. It's not science fiction anymore. And uh, something very interesting also is the augmented reality. Uh, the, I looked for the definition in the, uh, on the internet. It's the expansion of physical reality by adding layers of computer-generated information to the real environment. Uh, um, a more easy example is the, is the GPS in your car. It's augmented reality, in fact. 
when you you get some uh, some data some um, computer generated information to help you make your decisions and uh, we uh, could easily uh, well, easily maybe we could use it to optimize vehicle loading and to help the drivers we could very well imagine a solution uh, when uh, where uh, you know which vehicles you're going to load you're the driver and there's there's a group of vehicles you're going to load while you tell the you tell your computer which which brand and which uh, model they are and uh, where where each of them uh, is going to uh, to be um, unloaded and the computer generates the, generates the right uh, the optimal the optimal um, load the optimal way to load them and then guides you step by step while you you do the uh, you arrange your your truck uh, this way and that and you load the first car and this is the first car then the second car is this one you arrange your truck uh, this way and that and you load the second car this way so um, this uh, already exists for general cargo i know but uh, um, uh, it could also exist for vehicle loading and uh, this uh, this would uh, be one of uh, the answers of the for the driver shortage we have if uh, if we have this type of um, of tool to help the drivers uh, you will have uh, less need to for a long uh, training of the drivers and better results uh, uh, in the performance of the young drivers uh, the, the benefit will be complete because uh, you would have less um, less uh, transport damages uh, if we consider that the quality rules would be uh, would be integrated in the computer uh, software you would have you would spend less time uh, uh, generating uh, the, the loading plan less time uh, during the loading operations and uh, also uh, it uh, uh, it could also optimize the, the load factor automatically so you will never lose uh, uh, one car when you when you could have uh, put one more and uh, on the track and there's also the driverless trucks driverless trucks are to be trialed in the UK and motorways we know that so uh, uh, it, it could also be uh, an intervention of uh, new technologies in the future well of course the challenge is to make these investments in a low margin industry as was uh, <laughs> as was uh, mentioned before but uh, the, we now have a, a rich uh, possibility rich possibilities of uh, uh, of strong technical um, progress and uh, i think that uh, if we manage to uh, to integrate all this in the in the business uh, uh, it will be a real revolution okay debbie have you got anything to add i mean you kind of introduced the subject but if there is, is there anything else you want to add to that uh, just to, to absolutely agree. Well, for I think goodness sake. <laughs> feeling the love. <laughs> um, yeah, just, just to say that the, the technological advancements are inevitable. We can see them coming. And typically, um, they're, they're benefits that we're directing towards the customer. Um, when, when we look at the autonomous car and, and we look at connected car, it's always about the Wi-Fi for the customer, about avoiding hitting the pedestrian, the avoiding hitting the other car. Mm -hmm. and, and I think um, certainly, certainly from last year, you'll understand that we started to explore connected car and, and not just what it can do for the customer. It's happening, it's going into our vehicles. So, so let's look back, look over our shoulder and let's understand and start to work on what benefits it gives to the business also. So... Um, so, great, I don't want to hit a pedestrian either, but equally, with the sensors and the ability to, to brake, 
I can park nicely within not just the plant but the compounds. Mm -hmm. We can avoid the damage that we're, we're causing on our vehicles. Um, we all know about the constraints we have. Our vehicles are getting bigger. They're, we're struggling to fit them onto whether it be transporters or rail. If we're not having to open doors because we don't have drivers, it's giving Gus um, better ability to optimise the loads and, and to increase the load factors and, and absolutely reduce the damage. I watched recently um, a comparison between an autonomous vehicle and, and a guy driving the car. Same, same car. And, uh, and they looked at, over a period of time, the precision of what this, this guy was doing. Um, the accuracy from the autonomous car was far superior. The speed at which he was able to do that repeatedly um, was, was really, really impressive. And, and I thought, well, it, it would be novel to, to not be hurting and damaging our wheels and, and not clipping the, the skirt. So, so for me, I think, yes, it's fantastic. Um, I love the technology. I love everything that's coming on board. Um, we need to be clever and, and start to take advantage of these. And, and as Hervé says, it's, it's happening. No, no longer is it you know, some far-fetched idea. It's, it's reality, and we need to accelerate the progress and start to enjoy some of the benefits that we're putting in our customer vehicles. Well, personally, I hope that autonomous trucks and cars are a long way away. Long may we remain as inefficient as we are to keep automotive logistics conferences in business. So uh, I think we've overrun a little bit, and I know you won't know this just by looking at me, but actually lunch is quite important to me. So I'd like to thank our panel for a very interesting session. Thank you. The next sessions are sustainability will be in this room. Uh, plant logistics will be uh, in, the, in the other room across the corridor. But please join us for our lunch, which today's hosted by Priority Freight on their 20th anniversary. Thank you.